Thank you so much, uh, Tanzia, for your wonderful introduction. It didn't sound like me at all. <laughs> And uh, I want to say a special thanks to Green University um, and especially to your Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Fakir, and your special guest, the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Razak, and also greetings to Dr. Bartholomew. Um, and a special thanks to um, Sirajam Munira as well for putting together this event and for participating in this event. And a special thank you to everyone who has joined us this afternoon for taking the time to be here. I understand that I will be speaking to a mixture of students and teachers. So I have uh, prepared my talk with that in mind. And I'm going to show you a PowerPoint slideshow as I speak. Um, but if you are interested in obtaining a copy of this, uh, you can contact Sirajum Munira, who uh, also has a copy. There is some hopefully useful information in here that uh, you may wish to record in some way. Of course, you can take screenshots or photographs um, as well. So please feel very welcome to do that. So let me begin. I will share my screen and minimize the window. Okay, so let's go back. So our, our topic for today is my word, vocabulary learning, principles, strategies, activities, and personal stories. And I'd like to talk about three things in particular today. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is what we should be learning and why we should be learning it when we are learning vocabulary in another language. And as you are learning English, this applies, of course, to learning English. But it could equally apply to other languages we are learning as well. The second thing I'd like to talk to you about is vocabulary learning strategies or ways of learning and some activities to support what we are trying to do when we learn vocabulary. And then thirdly, I want to kind of push the boundaries a little and talk a little about what it means to build an identity in another language and um, to reinforce our vocabulary knowledge, to strengthen our vocabulary knowledge through the use of personal stories. And that's a little bit different perhaps from what you may have thought about in the past when you have been studying vocabulary. So I hope that last one is of great interest to you. So here is someone who is telling stories and using words. And of course, we all know that we cannot tell stories without words. So let's go to the first point then, some foundational principles, some basic things we need to think about when we're learning words. And the first question we need to ask ourselves is, what should I learn? English has thousands and thousands of words. So where do we start? In fact, depending on how you define word, there are around 1.5 million words in English. And more words are being added to the English language at a rate of about 14.7 new words every day. So how does that make you feel when you hear that? That's a lot of words, isn't it? In fact, it's an enormous number of words. And maybe you feel a little like this little girl here. It's just too much for you to carry. You can't deal with that number of words. <clears throat> so you need to think about 
which words are the most useful words for you to learn? Because obviously we cannot manage to learn one and a half million words. Even native speakers of English don't know one and a half million words. And maybe you're feeling a little bit like this guy. Ah! Oh! <laughs> Too many words, but you don't have to try and learn that many words. Studies show that most native English speakers only know about 20,000 words. Well, that's still quite a lot, isn't it? And well-educated, university-educated people know about 40,000 words. So that's, even that is a lot of words. However, most native speakers of English only use around 5,000 general words every day in everyday speaking, listening, reading, and writing. So that's getting to a more manageable level, isn't it? 5,000 words. I might be able to reach that. Okay, we call these words, these everyday words, high frequency, general words. High frequency meaning they're very common. We meet them a lot. And then if you are a university student, studies show that there are around 600 academic words or university level words in English that you need to know. So this is looking a little bit more achievable. These words, these high frequency words, these general high frequency words, these high frequency academic or university level words, these are the most important words that you need to know and so those are the words you should be learning first before you learn other words. In fact, here's some um, information that might help you see how to achieve this. If you learn around five new general English words every day, that's 35 words a week, that's 1,820 a year, in three years, you will know over 5,000 general English words. Okay, so you will be able to understand and take part in everyday English communication, whether that's speaking, reading, listening, or writing. So, as I said, that's about the same number that is used by native speakers of English in everyday communication. Now let's think about mixing up general English words and academic words. We call these AWL or academic word list words. If you learn three general English words and two academic words every day, new words, again 35 words a week, 1800 or a little more per year, in three years you will know around 3000 general words and all the academic words that you need for university study, the key words, that is. Not the special words, but the key academic words. So the good news is that you already know a lot of these general English words and some of the academic words, I'm sure. So the, the fact is, the truth is that after three years, the true size of your total vocabulary knowledge will be much bigger than this. Okay, so that's actually quite good news for you. If you are diligent, if you work hard, and you know, if you learn five words per day, your vocabulary knowledge will be much bigger than the basic 5,000 words that you need. So you can do it. That's the first message I have for you. Okay, you don't need to be put off or afraid of that one and a half million words that I talked about to begin with. You can aim for something that you really can achieve. 
and the decision, I guess, is up to you. If you say, I can and I will, if you give yourself that goal, that aim, uh, then maybe you will work towards that. So that was the what should we be learning. The next thing I want to talk about is why. Why should we be learning these words in particular? Well, these high frequency words are important because they're the most common words used in English in all situations. In everyday life and in academic or university life. And here's a secret. Native English speakers who study at university also need to learn the academic word list words. In fact, anyone who is studying subjects at, in English at university must know the academic words to succeed. So you're not alone. Just because English is not your first language, it doesn't mean that you are uh, a step behind, really. Other people who have English as their native language also have to learn these academic words for university study. So here is your goal, really. If you know the first 2,000 general service list or the general English words plus 600 or so academic word list words, you will be able to read and understand around 87% of what you read in English at university in any subject doesn't matter if it is history, biology, economics, management, all subjects use these common academic words. And if you know at least 80% of the first 2000 high frequency general words, that's when you're ready to start learning the academic words. And I would guess if you're in your first or second year at university, you probably know around 80% or you're close to knowing around 80% of the first 2000 common general English words. So if that's the case, you can start learning the words from the academic word list. So you're probably asking this question as I'm speaking. Where can I find these words? <laughs> it's all very well to tell you you need to learn these words, but where are they? And this is where you might want to take a screenshot. Okay, so the GSL or the general English words can be found at this website. They were created by a person called Michael West in 1953. And it's interesting because Michael West had strong contact and connections with Bangladesh. He lived in Bangladesh for quite a long time. And he created the first list of common English words. And it's still a valuable, useful list. And I use this list even today. Um, of course, because it was created in 1953, there are new words that have uh, come into the list. And you can find some of these in the first list of the new general words uh, which are available at this website. So when you click on this website, find this information. Go to new uh, GSL lists and go to this link here. Follow this link here. So again, you might want to screenshot or copy that. And then as for the academic words, you can find those words uh, at this website here. Okay, so go to the N-A-W-L in alphabetical order. So that information tells you where to go once you go to this website. I'll just leave that there for a moment to give people time to copy that or photograph that or make a note of that. I'm just pausing at this point to allow people time to record that.
If you miss it, you can contact um, Sirajim afterwards, Sirajim Munira, who has a copy of this PowerPoint and she can give you this um, slide information as well. Okay, so these are the, the websites where you can find the most common words in general English everyday use and in academic or university life. The next question you might be asking is, <clears throat> what about the words that are not on these lists? Well, other words, um, learning other words really depends on your current level of English ability and the subjects that you are studying. And we call these other words off list words. And it's most useful to learn these words after you have studied the academic word list and you know most of those words. Or if you are studying your classes in English at university, you will meet those words as you study. Your teachers will use them a lot. The special terms, the special words that belong to each subject area, you will meet them. So for example, if you're studying biology or economics, you will meet words like photosynthesis or autarky, for example. These are not high frequency words, but they are important for the subjects that you are studying. And we call these discipline specific or specialized words or just technical words. And you only need to learn those as you meet them and as you need them, just like native speakers of English do. Right? So I wouldn't spend a lot of time learning words like this until you really need to know them. Focus on learning the general words and the academic word list words first. So you'll gradually learn those special subject discipline words as you complete your higher level studies in various content areas because your professors will use them and explain them to you and you'll meet them in your course readings. And you should make um, a special note or a list or a section in your vocabulary records to put those special words. Okay, the other thing I wanted to say about the academic word list, the academic words are also important for your life after university. If you have to use English in the business world or in your workplace or in a situation where you need to communicate across countries or if you are entering into higher learning research and so on, whatever your career pathway is. So they are important for you. Okay, let's move on. We've talked about what and why, and now I'd like to talk about some strategies or ways of learning and some activities you can do to help you learn. So one of the first things I'd like to say about ways of learning vocabulary is quite important. When you learn several new words at the same time, it's important to make sure that they are different from each other in their meaning, in their spelling, and in their sound. So if you look at these three words here, you can see they're quite different. An apple is a fruit, a bicycle is something you ride, and danger is a situation that you do not want to be in, right? So they're, they're quite different in meaning, the spelling is quite different, and the sound of these words is quite different. And it's important not to try to learn two or more new words at the same time if they are similar in any way. If the theme or the meaning of the word or the spelling or the sound is similar, research tells us that this confuses our brain. And I can give an example from Japanese, from my own learning, uh, which may not relate very well to um, Bangladesh, but you might be able to uh, see what I'm trying to say here. 
there are two verbs doing words in Japanese. One is tsukuru and another one is tsukau. And you can hear the tsu and the ku and the u. They sound very similar. Okay. And one of those verbs means to make, and the other one means to do. And when I first started learning Japanese, I tried to learn these two words at the same time. And that was in 2009. And today it is 2020, and I still mix up these two words when I use them in Japanese. My Japanese is not that wonderful, but to me, this is a good example of trying to learn two words that are similar at the same time and really not learning them at all or not learning them properly, not learning them well. So don't try and learn words that are similar in meaning. So apple, banana and orange, they're all fruit. And danger, stranger, ranger, they sound very similar and the spelling is similar. Same with bicycle recycle, cyclical. Okay, so we say research tells us this is not a good thing for us to do. Make sure the new words that you learn are different. And many of you, especially teachers, might be saying, but this is really different from what textbooks do. And you're quite right. Textbooks often give us chapters that are related to a theme. So you might have a chapter on transport in your textbook and you'll learn bus, motorbike, car, taxi, truck, um, all at the same time. And, you know, I think textbook writers put these words together because it seems sensible to arrange them that way. But really studies show us that students don't learn well when we combine meanings and spelling and sound together. So I'd like to recommend that you try something different by not doing that anymore. Okay, so more strategies and activities. As I said, aim to learn about five to seven new words every day from the lists, depending on your level of ability. Most students at university who are learning English will be studying the first two to three thousand general English words and words from the academic word list. If you're not sure of your level, here's another website to go to. You can test yourself and you can find out how many words you know and where you should start putting your energy, where you should start learning. So again, take a screenshot of this if you're interested. When you know a word already, you should then learn another member of the same word family. So if the word on the word list is a noun and you know it well, then you should learn the adjective or the adverb or the verb. But don't try and do that at the same time if the word is new to you. Again, focus on the most common form of the word first. And it's important to review your words often and to have a system or a pattern or a habit um, to help you do this. And over time, you should space out your review times. So in the beginning, you should review often and then as time goes by, you can space out your review times. But the key is repeat, 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 okay? And as we say in English, use it. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So before the end of your second year of university studies, it should be your goal to learn all those words from the academic word list. I wonder how close you are. Vocabulary is the key to learning another language. In fact, studies tell us that vocabulary knowledge accounts for around 71% of your ability in another language. And people who study vocabulary 
tell us that around 25% of our learning time should be given to vocabulary learning because vocabulary knowledge drives other language learning. And without vocabulary, you can't say anything, even if you know a lot about grammar. So I would say focus more on learning vocabulary. You can say more, even if the grammar's incorrect at times, you can still communicate an idea. And these are some usual or common activities that teachers give students. Things like games and drills and puzzles, uh, filling in a blank. I'm not going to go through all of these, but as you look at these, I think you'll see examples of activities you have done in the past to try and help you remember vocabulary. And I want to say to you, well, these are okay. They're useful to some degree but they're more useful for review, not so useful for learning. But actually it's not what you do so much as doing uh, the work frequently, doing it often. Okay, so anything that you can do to help you learn those key high frequency common words, anything is useful, but some things are more useful than others. And I'd like to focus on what I think are more useful ways of actually learning vocabulary. And the reason for that is many of the activities I just showed you, um, they are classroom activities, but they're not really things that people do in the real world when they use words. So you might be asking, why on earth am I doing these things in class then? Or why am I doing these things for homework? These are very mechanical, repetitive activities. And they don't really have a strong purpose in the sense of communication. They're often a little bit boring. And because they're a bit boring, Sometimes students don't feel like doing them. They don't feel motivated and they're asking themselves, why on earth am I doing this? You know, it's a wonderful day outside. <laughs> why should I be filling the gaps or completing a puzzle or doing a word find? So many vocabulary learning tasks fail to get learners to think deeply about the words. A deep processing is really important. Students have to have a genuine, real need to know a word and to use it. And if they don't feel a need, they're not really going to learn it. And many of these tasks or activities don't require students to use language in a creative or original way. Okay, so they're a, bit, they're a bit dull and they're not really getting you to think deeply. And thirdly, a lot of these activities do not put the vocabulary into a rich context, a meaningful context. They're studied in isolation. And they really need to be put into a context or into a situation. So just as these people here are looking at what is an elephant, they're only looking at one part, aren't they? So they're going to go away not really understanding what an elephant is. They're only going to think about the small part that they could see. And so it is with words. If we don't use them, if we don't think about them deeply, and if we don't put them into a real situation, we fail to really understand and learn them well. So why is this important? Well, research tells us that processing or studying something deeply affects our long-term learning. We're more likely to remember things for a long time if we really need to know the word, if we have to search for the meaning, 
and if we have to make decisions about whether those words should be used in the way we want to use them or not. So in the beginning, when we first meet a word, yes, we do need to think about the spelling and the pronunciation and the meaning, that's important. But we quickly need to move past that and focus on how to use that word or use that language as much as possible. And we should be trying to put that word to work for us in many different situations so that our knowledge of that word becomes automatic. So it's really important for teachers and for students themselves to look for ways to use new vocabulary in a creative, original way, because really, when you, have, when you think about it, that's what we're aiming to do. We're aiming to be able to use English in ways that we want to use English in the future, in original ways, in our own ways. So effectively, we need to make the best use of our learning time by using strategies or methods that provide lasting results, not just practice activities, not just review activities. As important as they are, we need to go beyond that. So we need to ask ourselves a key question. What does it really mean to know a word? How do you know that you know a word? Well, yes, we talked about form. Form covers the spelling, the stress, where do you put the strong part of the word, the pronunciation of the different sounds within a word, other words in the same family. We need to know the meaning. Can we recognize it when we meet it, when we read or listen? And can we use it? And the last one is what I'd like you to really think about. Can we pull it out of our brain? Can we retrieve it and use it in the right way when we need to? And we call this active knowledge, okay? Because it involves production or using the word. And also with that comes um, other things like using idioms and word patterns or collocations. The key therefore in using is can we do this? Can we use a word easily and with flexibility? Can we manipulate or shape that word and change it to fit our own sentences? And here's a young Bangladeshi student who helped me last year using English in a very um, interesting discussion with a THT member. He was having an ordinary everyday conversation with her, but he was using the language, using his vocabulary knowledge freely and in a very original way. And that's what we're aiming for. So often as language learners, in a non-native English speaking setting, we give most of our attention to the form and the meaning of words and not enough attention to use. And it is difficult if you don't have people to practice speaking English with. So let's talk now about some activities we can use. We don't want to be like this cat who's looking at the guitar and thinking, well, yes, I can see the shape of it and I know it makes sound, but I can't play it, right? So that's what we, we don't want to be like the cat when we're using language. We don't want to just know the form and the meaning of the word. We also want to be able to use the word and get some pleasure from our use, just as we would get pleasure from playing music. So here's the first activity I'd like to explain to you. The first activity is uh, a pair activity. Students each have a word list and the words come from those common English language uh, lists that I mentioned. And they come also from a reading text that has been studied in the past. So the students have completed a reading and then afterwards they have the words from the reading that they're trying to learn 
and person A retells the information in their own words using as many words as possible and person B checks off the words as they are used and then gives feedback when the first person has finished. And of course in this activity any form of the word may be used and words can be used more than once. And students can look at the reading but they shouldn't just read directly from it. So that's one activity. A second activity um, is very similar. So you would switch pairs and repeat it, but this time when you work in pairs, they use the same word list. Instead of repeating the information from the reading, the person can talk about something that relates to the theme of the reading or give their opinions about the reading or talk about their personal experiences using their own original sentences. And student B again checks off the words and they switch and repeat when they have finished. This is more challenging and it requires deeper processing, more original language and a stronger ability to use the words in a suitable context. Okay, these can be act, uh, practiced outside class time too, so you don't have to wait for your teacher to tell you to do this. These two activities can also become writing activities. So after studying a re reading text and reviewing the list of words, students can retell the information and put a circle around the words that they have used or they can write a set number of words about a topic that the teacher gives them relating to the reading in some way. Or they can write on a free choice topic using the list words again. And I always suggest that students spend three to five minutes thinking and preparing before they do this task. And don't take too long, write as much as you can within 10 to 15 minutes. And then count up how many list words you used and the total number of words you used. And each time you do the activity, try to use more target words. And again, you can practice this on your own. It's very important to share and discuss your writing as well. So exchange your work with each other, read what your partners write, and I think writing should always have a real audience, not just the teacher. And students should take some time commenting to each other and asking questions in English, both on the content and on the vocabulary and the way it was used. And as they comment and speak, they can use the vocabulary again, again using original sentences. And there's other things you can do. You can share your writing to a whole class or in an English club, or you can create documents online using Google Docs, for example, and share your writing that way and comments about it. So teachers, you can collect work, but if your focus is vocabulary, it's important not to correct every error. Just focus on checking the way the target vocabulary is used, okay? And then writers will notice that and focus on the vocabulary more. If you want to focus on grammar, you can do that through other activities. Okay, let's move on to my third point, taking it further. Building an English identity and long-term vocabulary knowledge through personal stories. Let's quickly think about language first. Language is not just a tool or a goal or a means to a career. Language is not just words. Language is a way of telling people who we are. It relates to our family, our culture, everything about us. Okay, so language and our identity are very close and connected. So here's a challenge for you. If language is identity, then who am I in English? People often say when they learn another language, they feel as though they have a different personality. So who do you want to be when you are speaking English? What is your identity when you are using English? Who are you? 
And of course, the question, what on earth do these questions have to do with using vocabulary? Well, let's think, what is identity? Identity is how we understand our relationship to the world and how we understand possibilities for the future across space and time. And how do we create our identity? We do that through stories. It's a means of defining ourselves. And the stories that we tell about ourselves change throughout our lives. And they help us to understand who we are. So expressing your identity in English and building vocabulary knowledge can be done together. If long-term vocabulary learning comes from processing vocabulary in a deep way, using it in an original way, in a meaningful context, then writing and telling stories in English about the things I do, the things I know, the things I have experienced, this will help me to do all of these things, to build my vocabulary knowledge and build a clearer picture of who I am in English. So three things you can do to put today's learning to work for you. One thing is to write journals. Describe your daily activities, events, thoughts, impressions, and use the vocabulary you're learning in your writing. Go back and check it over time to notice your progress. Secondly, read the stories of others, and this website, X Reading, is a very useful website for reading graded material. Teachers might uh, like to ask their schools if they can support having X Reading in the classroom. I use this a lot with my lower level students for reading for pleasure, which Dr. Bartholomew talked about in his previous talk. And thirdly, write and share short stories that you have written yourself, both fiction, not true, and non-fiction, true. Okay, talk about your life in Bangladesh, your experiences, your thoughts, imaginary events, anything, and use the vocabulary you're learning in your writing. And here's a newsflash. If you choose to do that, and I hope many of you do, you can send me your stories. And if we like your stories, we can put them on our website for other people in Bangladesh to use. Our website has stories written by Bangladeshi people, not just teachers, but also students. Our youngest person is a 10 year old girl who has written poetry and her work is up there. So your work could be used in our project. So stories about ourselves, uh, as Tanzia mentioned at the beginning, is a project for students and teachers of English in Bangladesh to create good quality graded stories and reading materials for each other to use. Stories that talk about Bangladesh and you can access this material um, by going to the Belta website and clicking on the link there. So each story is written by a team member who sends it to me. I grade it, I correct the grammar if necessary, I check to see how difficult it is. There is no payment, there are no fees. You do not have to write perfect English and I would work with you to uh, make the story ready for publication. And we use high frequency or common word lists to make sure that readers learn the words they really need to, to know. And the stories reflect the identity of people in Bangladesh. And if you're a teacher or a university person, your story can count as an official publication for your CV. So here are a few examples of stories by people. Uh, that we have accepted. And here is one of our young students from East West University who has submitted stories to us. And this is just an example of the beginning of one of her stories. 
This is a pre-intermediate to intermediate level story. So if you'd like to build your knowledge of English vocabulary and explore your identity uh, in English and contribute, please send me an email message and I can send you more information. Remember, everyone has stories to tell and your stories are important. I'm sure each of these people have a story that we could hear from them, if only they would tell it. So you can email me at this address and put stories about ourselves into the subject line of your email. And these are a few references. Um, and maybe we won't have time to think about this, but think about these things for yourself. What did you learn? What new thing are you going to do? Or what are you going to do differently after today's presentation? And what questions or comments do you have? And I have now finished, so I will stop sharing my screen. And thank you very much for your attention.